we welcome you to the evening as Thursday study and uh, we're thinking here of a thrilling account. Uh, it's uh, in Acts 13, 13 to 33 and uh, we shall be looking at relating God's plan is one thing uh, and then uh, reviewing God's provision and uh, a sec thirdly recalling mm -hmm. God's power so there are three things we're going to look at uh, the Apostle Paul was in uh, uh, the Apostle Paul was in, in uh, Cyprus and now he's gone to the modern day uh, Turkey and uh, uh, south of Turkey and to Pisidian Antioch so we are thinking then of relating God's plan. You know, we want to note that the Jews read the law and the prophets. Mm. And they presumably will have an exposition to follow that. Uh, verse 15. And Paul addresses the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were those uh, people of Israel and the Gentiles were the God-fearing. Those who wanted to come and to hear God's word. In Acts uh, 17, chapter 13, verse 17, mm -hmm. we're reading, The God of this people, mm -hmm. Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. So, uh, there it is, that's the... Uh, so the God of this uh, period chose our f fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers. Now, this really was uh, reminding us of God's plan. And God chose uh, his people. He chose Israel. Uh, they, weren't because, they weren't the greatest people on the earth. They weren't the best people on the earth, but he chose them. Uh, they were small and... and uh, there wasn't, uh, wasn't a great people, and there wasn't any particular reason, but he set his love upon them, and he chose them. Uh, and then he exalted them when they, they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And there they, they were, uh, you know, they were, uh, a, that means to be exalted meant that they were uh, really, uh, he, he um, prepared them, you know, he, he uh, took good care of them, and, and he brought them through uh, Egypt, you see, and right out, uh, you know, and through all the plagues and all the things that happened there in Egypt, the ten plagues, and then, of course, they had that great Passover meal, and the, the, the lamb, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, and, of course, that is pointing, of course, too, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God. And so he brought them out of Egypt with a great hand. That was really uh, reminding us of his uh, salvation, you know. All right. Reminding that he, was, he came to save. And uh, uh, to save those people there. In, uh, in, uh, particularly the, the Hebrews, the people from Ken. All right. So... He brought them then through the wilderness wanderings, verse 18. The wilderness uh, wanderings, of course. Uh, for 40 years they were, verse 18 there, they were trying the wilderness. And uh, he, uh, he dealt with them there and they learned a lot. He fed them and kept them and uh, even their clothes didn't wear out. So that was quite a, a good time as well, you know. For them. Uh, what else then he uh, had to get rid of this uh, we sorry about that and then of course there was the allocation of Canaan out of, out of the after the wilderness wanderings he, uh, he allocated Canaan to them and he had uh, Joshua to lead them in and uh, he gave the lands then you see allocated the land to them, the various areas for them. He drove out seven nations and gave them a special place. He had special favour upon them 
and uh, mm. that was quite interesting. So this was uh, great for, for Israelites, this was great for uh, Jews to hear all these stories. And they would really be amazingly concerned to hear that. And then, uh, you know, we've seen there God's plan for them, to, to bring them out, to make them a nation. And then, of course, we have reviewing God's provision. The provision God made, he made a great provision for them. And, uh, you know, he, it leads on there that there were judges. Then, they ruled for 450 years. And the last one of the judges was Samuel, of course. And King Saul was the first king in, in Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, uh, that was Saul, he raised him up, he raised, he, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Uh, right? So this, this was an amazing, uh, David was an amazing king and an amazing ruler. Uh, he wasn't perfect, as we were noting on last Sunday night. Uh, but he's, um, he was interesting, too, how God worked with him and... Uh, to see what God done in his life. But you see, the thing about it was that David, that King David was obedient to God's way, it's, it tells us there. He, he was obedient, he followed God, he followed his way, uh, and he, um, he did his will. Uh, he wasn't perfect, and he failed in many ways at many times. You see, in the life of David, mm. when, when David sought, mm. uh, you know, God's will, he was directed right. But there were times when he didn't uh, ask for God's will. He didn't pray to God. And then it didn't work out, you know. And uh, uh, there was problems, of course. Right. When God spoke, David acted, you see. When he spoke, he, he really followed what God said and God's will. At one time, he wanted to build a, a temple uh, for God. And uh, Nathan the prophet said, yeah, yes, I'm sure, that's fine. But then God uh, had a message to Nathan and told him, no, you're not. Uh, you're not the one to build it. It's your son Solomon who will build the temple. So what was God's provision? That was the great thing. What was God providing? What was he showing here to David? Uh, and uh, of course, it's, it's so wonderful uh, when we think about these things. It's not going to work out to be this. Verse 23, for this man's seed, according to the promise. So he's here, uh, the apostle Paul is reminding them that God made a promise. God raised up for Israel as Saviour Jesus. So this is the great thing that it's it's the sending, God sending his son. God's uh, wanting to save his people uh, from their sins. Right. And uh, it's again a promise there in Isaiah 11.1. 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. You see, so there's a, a prophecy again. There were other prophecies uh, and, uh, about the coming of the Messiah. A branch. And that branch, you see, is coming like a, a, a root out of a dry ground. It, it uh, came when the tribe of Judah was very low. And there wasn't, uh, it didn't seem to be very many uh, of that tribe. But nevertheless, uh, that's how it happened. And uh, he, Jesus came forth from a really, uh, at that particular point and time, from a very few of that tribe and very few looking for the Messiah. And then 
John the Baptist then as well. John the Baptist preached repentance. Interesting how it puts it there that he preached repentance. And that was an important message, wasn't it? They were repent they were at before they were baptized. In verse 25, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? This was the, the, the really thing that John was bringing forward. Now, in case you get me wrong, people, in case you think I am the Christ, no, I'm not. Well, who do you think I am? I am not he. I am not the one. Uh, don't let you get the wrong end of the stick, as we would say. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. He's not worthy to be, he's saying, a servant. That's what a servant would do, would loose the, the sandals. The sandals, of course, they would have great tongs on the sandals. They could be laced up around his ankles and higher, and, and that's how they would be kept on. You know, and uh, he's talking about a servant's job would be that. He said, John says, I'm not worthy. We're not worthy, of course, to do anything for Jesus. And then recalling God's power. He's, he's, he's thinking of the plan. And, and, and uh, then lastly, uh, we're, we're thinking then recalling God's power. The power of God. What power? How did he display his power? He appeals, of course, to their lineage, doesn't he? He again comes back to this and he, he speaks to them, you know, in the beginning of men of Israel and a new God-fearing people to the Gentiles. I don't know whether they were behind a, a cage like that or not, you know, in the synagogue. But it did show there a little bit how, how they work in the synagogue. Right. So he appeals to the lineage. He appeals to the background. He appeals to them. That they're, uh, you know, sons and daughters of, of, of Abraham, aren't they? Uh, verse 26. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be wonderful. So he appeals to them in that way. That's going to hold their attention. And those among you who fear God, to you, you see, it says, the word of this salvation has been sent. Isn't that amazing, isn't it? So that's the great thing about it. Is, is this God's salvation is sent, you see, and it comes to <coughs> Jesus. And... Uh, and God is sending his, his salvation to save us. He's shown us how he can save us. God's power really to save is it's, it's, uh, sent, isn't it? The word sent there. God's power to save us. It's, it's really sent. And God, of course, he is the one to save and to redeem us. All right. And God wants people to know Jesus. That's the great thing. To put their faith and trust in him. To know him as their Lord and Saviour. And so he wants us to know him. Know him personally. And how can we know him personally? As we you know, come and ask him into our lives. As we pray to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need to know you. I need to follow you. I need to be your child. And I ask you into my life. So God wants people to know Jesus personally. That's, that's the great message, you know, that uh, came, you know, that uh, what's happening. And God was preparing Israel, you see, for the coming of the Messiah. That was the great thing, the preparation. He prepared them in times of old. And he, he's um, still preparing, he's still working in their lives and sending the Saviour. And God's word was fulfilled. You know, that was the main thing about it. God's word. What God said was fulfilled. Everything, the promises, all the promises about Jesus were fulfilled. The only one that's not fulfilled, of course, is that he is coming again. That is, we're waiting for that day uh, when he comes again. But in the meantime, everything about him has been fulfilled. There's so many prophecies 
I've heard people talking about how many prophecies there were, uh, uh, you know. And, you know, the, I've, I've uh, read about one man and he came to faith in Christ because all these prophecies were fulfilled, so many fulfilled. It's great to know, you see, that it all works together. And then verse 29, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. Now wonderful, isn't it? That's a great verse to think about, a great line. Now when they had, verse 29, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. So you see, they were doing all the things, you know, maybe they thought they were doing it to him. Maybe they thought they were getting this, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, out of the way. But everything was written in God's Word. Uh, and you know, when Jesus was walking to the cross, with, 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 with the cross, or carrying the cross, he was repeating Psalm, uh, Psalm 22. And, uh, and you know, where he's saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, everything was done. Uh, and, uh, and when everything was done then, Jesus said, it is finished. It was the payment of a debt. Uh, he laid down his life. And they, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and others, they came and they prepared him and laid him in the tomb. He was laid even in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah tells us. But you see, the whole thing about it is that God raised him from the dead. You know, the grave couldn't hold it. That's what uh, Paul is getting across. That God raised Jesus from the dead. Wasn't that the great thing? That, that uh, you see, death couldn't hold him. And God didn't want him, you see, because, you see, the proof that this, the sacrifice of Jesus and Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient was that, you see, God raising him from the dead. That's so wonderful. And that is so, so, so amazing, isn't it? That that was important. The important fact is the resurrection, isn't it? There was many witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. There was over 500. Uh, there were those, uh, uh, his uh, own uh, followers, his own disciples, uh, were eyewitnesses of it. And they were the hardest to convince. But there were many others who seen him too. And the women, of course, who came to the tomb. Well, what's the purpose? Uh, verse 32. What's the purpose of it all then? Uh, why this? And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. There is, isn't it, the purpose of it? What is it? The good news, the good tidings. Here we're bringing you uh, great uh, blessings. Here we're bringing you the good news of the gospel. Here we're giving you the purpose for life and the blessings for life. And you can trust in Jesus. And so that, that was the great fact of it. You know that he uh, had died on the cross, paid the price of our sins, and this was the great purpose that he was risen again from the dead. God has fulfilled this for us too, isn't it? Verse 33. What has he fulfilled? God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. And as it is written in the second psalm, you're my son, today I have begotten you. And that might be a difficult verse for you to take in, uh, but nevertheless, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, it's in the day of eternity with God, and Christ, of course, is the eternally begotten Son of God. It's not that he was, that he became, uh, you know, that he was God's son from his birth at Bethlehem. He is eternally. He was with the Father, and of course, God is speaking in these terms that he's the eternally begotten Son of God. He had no beginning, he's eternal, he had no end, and uh, 
you know, so so amazing, isn't it? What a wonderful request then from the Father to the Son there, because that's a great uh, messianic psalm, Psalm two verse eight, where the Father says to the Son, "Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession." How amazing! So, there is the great thing, there's the great promise, there is the great provision, isn't it, uh, that uh, God the Father is giving, that he is going to inherit the, the ends of the earth. Yes, people all over the world are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Many people are trusting in him. There's a great number, and there'll be a multitude that no one can number. And so we can rest assured in that. And so, this was the great message. Uh, the Jews maybe weren't too happy for it, but of course we see the Gentiles were, and they did want uh, later on to hear something more about that. And so, we thought about a thrilling account that Paul brought to those people. We thought of God's plan, God's provision, uh, and power. And so, it was all, uh, uh, you know, displayed there. It was all seen, and God's plan is to save us, isn't it? God's provision in sending Jesus to pay the price of our sin. And that power, you see, is seen there in raising him from the dead, the proof of it all. Because without the resurrection, you know, no resurrection, no Christianity. If, if they could, many did try to disprove the resurrection, but they had to see that it was that there was ample proof in the Bible there, in the Gospels. And these eyewitness account were so wonderful that they, you know. So there it is. That's our message. And uh, thank you for listening. Our gracious God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your hand upon us. We thank you for sending Jesus. We know that he is the answer. We know that he is the hope, he is the blessing. We pray, Lord, you're leading, and we pray, Lord, that you will guide by your Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, your help and your blessing, and guide each one of us. We pray, Lord, that you will lead and guide now by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen.